This is the entrance to our nation's largest submarine base and the largest submarine base in the free world. In 1867, the state of Connecticut gave the U.S. Navy this tract of land along the Thames River. But it wasn't until 50 years later that the former coaling station and training base gained importance as a submarine base. Some 500 square acres wedged between cliff-like highlands to the east and the shores of the Thames, it now has 270 buildings with more under construction. The base is typical of submarine activity, a lot going on in a compact space. Visitors here marvel at the extent of the training and support supplied to our submarine service from this highly concentrated facility. Here is the Navy's submarine school, growing along with the development of our submarine capability. The submarine base at New London Groton is a home port for our fleet ballistic missile or Polaris submarines, as well as for several squadrons of nuclear and diesel-powered attack submarines. The sub-base provides support of many kinds, engineering, supply, research, medical, for our far-flung submarine forces. One of its most vital missions is supporting its several submarine training functions. Literally, this is the Navy's undersea university. Close to 1,200 officers and more than 12,000 enlisted men live, work, and train here. All of them are volunteers for service in submarines. Only the men who have the desire and the ability may serve. The cream of the Navy's manpower is represented in this, the silent service. These dedicated volunteers are carefully screened and then put through a rigorous training period. Today's nuclear sailors learn nucleonics, metallurgy, electronics, miniaturization, systems integration, data processing, and a hundred other subjects. The submarine library here at the base is devoted to a chronological history of the submersible, from the earliest recorded beginnings through to the atomic age. Housed in this neat brick structure is a collection of more than 180 years of modern submarine history. Here is the record of the submarine as it grew from the earliest days, through our submarines at the time of the turn of the century, through World War I, World War II, to the present actuality of nuclear-powered, missile-firing, modern submersibles. The American Revolution brought about this nation's first venture in submarines. David Bushnell, a Yale University student, developed the means of exploding gunpowder underwater. But in order to make his underwater bombs effective, he had to have some method of attaching them to the bottom of enemy ships. And so he built the Turtle. This is a half-sized model. The Turtle was built at Old Saybrook, Connecticut, just a short distance from the New London Groton submarine base. Sergeant Ezra Lee, a volunteer Connecticut infantryman, was given command of the tiny oak vessel, and he set out at once to destroy the British fleet, which was lying in New York Harbor. The plan was to screw the bomb into the bottom of an English ship with an auger that was releasable from the top of the submarine. Attached to the auger, 150 pounds of gunpowder. The plan was to set a mechanical fuse to explode after a short time. But unknown to the Americans, the hulls of the British vessels were just a bit too much for the turtle. And either because of the hardness of the hulls or the lack of buoyancy in the submarine, Sergeant Lee was unable to fulfill his mission. Actually, the submarine was not recognized as a legitimate instrument of warfare until the Civil War. The first submarine, which actually sank another enemy vessel under combat conditions, was the Confederate boat Hunley. The victim was the Union frigate Housatonic on blockade station off Charleston, South Carolina. This is a northerner's conception of the crewed vessel and her 13-man crew in action. This model is taken from actual Confederate plans of the Hunley. The submarine was armed only with a gunpowder torpedo at the end of a 15-foot pole. When this crude bomb exploded, it blew a hole in the side of the Union frigate, which promptly sank, dragging the Hunley down with it with the loss of all hands. Although the Hunley succeeded in her mission, it wasn't until 40 years later that the submarine was built for use as a part of the regular Navy. John P. Holland, a native of Ireland, came to this country as an immigrant in 1872. He was a schoolteacher by profession, but in his spare time, he worked on plans for a submarine. He built several before the USS Holland, 
which became the first undersea craft commissioned by the U.S. Navy. The Holland was accepted on April 11, 1900 for a price of $150,000. The Navy was well pleased with the Holland and soon ordered six more submarines. Other nations soon followed suit, and during World War I, practically all naval powers had a submarine force. The German super submarine U-53 visited Newport, Rhode Island Harbor in 1916. Germany showed the rest of the world what could be done with an efficient submarine force during both world wars, in each case almost stopping the flow of goods to Europe before the U.S. intervened. The American submarine service in the Pacific Ocean during World War II was largely responsible for isolating Japan from her empire. Dollar for dollar, man for man, the submarine is this country's most economical weapon system. Comprising only 1.6% of the Navy's World War II personnel, the submarine service accounted for 55% of all enemy shipping destroyed. This more than all other branches of the services, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force combined. Now, as we've seen, submarines have been invented which are propelled by oars, sails, treadles, clockwork, springs, chemical engines, and electric motors. And now, nuclear power. Per cubic inch, there is more science packed into a submarine than into any other warship. The submariners say there's room for everything aboard a submarine except a mistake. Submarine, the crew must conduct hundreds of individual operational and equipment checks in order to train the officers and men of the submarine navy and the intricacies of handling these complex systems. Elaborately built, full-size operational mock-ups for coordinated training has been created here at the submarine school. Here, the key is training through simulation. This simulation is that of the submarine trigger, one of the first of the new post-war submarines. Here, diving and surfacing planes on the bow and stern, the ballast tank vents, trim manifolds, and high-pressure air controls are all manually operated, as opposed to the electrically operated controls in the nuclear submarines. Make your depth six zero feet smartly. Six zero feet smartly, aye, sir. All ahead, standard. All ahead, standard. <laughs> The alert crew members work in this valve-studded compartment as they would on a real submarine. Modern submarines travel faster submerged than on the surface. They can submerge in less than a few minutes. The sub must be able to dive quickly to great depths and to operate at these depths. Teamwork and the individual responsibility of all hands enable our submariners to invade the depths of the ocean. It's no wonder, then, that an esprit de corps and comradeship is a warm reality among men who share the dangers of the deep. And here in our landlocked submarine, the men in training are pitted against a giant computer under the direction of the training officer and the console operator. Dive! Make it at 100 feet. 100 feet, high. Five degree down, bubble. Make it at 100 feet. 100 feet, high. There are a number of different types of trainers at the submarine school. Each duplicates as closely as possible a typical type of submarine, World War II fleet type submarines, nuclear attack submarines, and of course the all-important Polaris submarine. Diving and surfacing simulators, fire control simulators, and attack simulators afford every opportunity for the trainee to learn and experience every tactical or operational situation. Maintain six knots in the turn. Actually, the submariner never finds himself in strange surroundings when he steps aboard his future ship. As you can imagine, modern undersea warfare employs complex electronic systems for submarine maneuvering. Necessarily, the officer and crewmen of our nuclear submarines must be thoroughly familiar with offensive and defensive tactics, not only under the sea, but on the surface as well. 
In addition, the attacking submarine and its crew must be prepared to work independently and with other units. Another contact bearing zero, niner zero, leave possible biologics. Very well, I concur. So now, uh, turn around on the north to see if you can pick up the target. In the cat and mouse game in the deep battlefields of the ocean, the submariner must rely on all of the sensing devices science can muster. Running blind in the ocean depths below periscope depth, the submarine must rely on sound. The sonar man is the ears of the boat. In submarine training, they must consider the myriad sounds he encounters. Our sonar devices have a sticky problem with false targets. Schools of whales may appear as another submarine. A school of snapping shrimp or porpoise sound like a zoo and can completely disorient a listener. Groping by sound for a target, the submarine officer must also know at all times his location in relation to the target and in relation to other ships and land areas. Now the computers can assist in this complex problem of maneuvering but a computer is only as good as the material that is fed into it. The major equipment in this attack trainer combines operational and simulated equipment and is based on the layout of a Polaris submarine. This is the fire control center where the actual aiming and firing of torpedoes and missiles is accomplished. Periscope is here and of course the communications equipment. The instructor's station contains the program operator's console. Here are facilities for inserting into the problem, various radar and sonar targets, and the projection system. The simulation is as near the actual as modern technology can accomplish. Historically, most of the earlier submarine officers were experienced surface ship officers, officers who had a working knowledge of ship handling and seamanship. With the advent of nuclear power and the missile age, submarines have gained increasing importance. The Navy's fleet ballistic missile, the Polaris weapon system, has been an important part of the nation's deterrent force since the USS George Washington went to sea with 16 ready-to-fire missiles in November of 1960. With this burgeoning submarine fleet, it's no longer possible to recruit experienced seamen from other fleet units. Many new officer graduates with nuclear specialties are becoming submariners without ever having experienced the usual ship handling techniques. To help bridge the gap in this conventional seamanship, the Navy's undersea university provides some simulated ship handling. submarine underway from the south side of Pier 1. Launcher at least gets Back the feel of handling tons of vessel, with most of it like an iceberg beneath the surface of the water. Now, as any boat owner knows, you just don't drive up to the pier, put on the brakes, and park. The new officer must also be familiar with the orders that are relayed from the bridge to the control stations deep within the submarine hull. Here in this mooring and docking trainer, scale models of both conventional and nuclear submarines are radio controlled. Orders from the officer on the bridge are relayed by a crewman at the control console to the model. Of course, this mooring and docking trainer doesn't provide all of the answers, but it does provide some opportunity for the new officer to learn a part of the technique of modern seamanship. For those who travel along the main highways through the New London Groton area, this huge silo-shaped tower is a landmark for the sub-base. Every submariner in the fleet is familiar with this escape training tank. All submarine officers and men receive their initial training here to prepare them for the event of a casualty to one of our submarines. Here is an unusual opportunity for you to see the tank from the inside. The training tank was drained for routine maintenance and repair, affording us an opportunity to illustrate for you the features of this, one of the most interesting classrooms in the Navy's undersea university. This 138-foot high vertical swimming pool holds about a quarter million gallons of water in a vertical column 18 feet in diameter and 118 feet high. This huge tank has been in almost constant use since it was built in 1930. Most important part of the tank are the escape locks or compartments which duplicate those installed on a submarine. These locks 
are at depths of 18, 50, 100, and 110 feet from the top, thus permitting training to be carried on under conditions similar to those a sailor would encounter in the depths of the sea. Now as the tank is again in action, that's fresh water, chemically treated, much like a swimming pool. However, the water is heated to 92 degrees. The instructors work approximately seven hours a day and require this warm water to maintain a near normal body temperature. The instructor's working uniform is simple enough, swimming trunks, face mask, and a nose clip. Of the 10 instructors in the water during the training session, only two of them depend upon the self-contained underwater breathing gear. The others rely on the air they inhale on the surface or in one of the locks. With practice, it's common for the instructors to remain underwater on one lungful of air for as long as four minutes. The director of the escape training tank and a medical officer specially trained in submarine and diving medicine are constantly in attendance. I want a good, <laughs> strong, forceful blow. Lay your head back and start a good, strong blow. <coughs> Grab hold of the side of your swim trunk so that you're not swimming with your hands. In this water, you do not do not swim. Your jacket's going to have 33 pounds of buoyancy. It's going to pull you right to the surface. <coughs> All right, this time, suck on a good long lung full of air. Really suck it on good. Go to the bottom of the ladder, lay your head back, and start your bluff. For more than 35 years, this most unusual classroom at the Navy's Undersea University has provided initial training to submariners. In addition, all officers and men of the submarine fleet are required to requalify in the tank every 30 months. After the unfortunate sinking of the S-51 in 1926 and the S-4 in 1927, a means for individual escape from sunken submarines was developed. This was the famous Momsen Lung, named for its developer, Admiral C.B. Momsen. It was in 1930 that the first training escapes were made in the London Escape Training Tank. Some 290,000 ascents were made at the tank using this Momsen Lung. An improvement on the Momsen Lung was the so-called buoyant ascent. Here the escapee wears a life jacket and rushes to the surface at 375 feet a minute. The rapid change in pressure makes it necessary for the escapee to exhale rapidly equalizing the pressure of air expanding in his lungs with that of the surrounding water as he rushes to the surface. The life jacket affords buoyancy once the escapee is on the surface, and the rapid ascent cuts down the time of pressure exposure. A relief valve in the life jacket helps to equalize its pressure with that of the water around it. Lieutenant Harris Stankey, a former director of the tank here in New London, sought to utilize the air expended through the relief valve in the life jacket, and thus developed the most recent and most effective method of escape yet devised. With the stanky hood, the escapee's head is completely enclosed in a bubble of air. The escapee now has greater confidence than ever in his chances for escape. Here's a fish's eye view, 110 feet down in the sub-escape tank as a trainee emerges from the escape lock. Safety is the watchword as the hood is checked, and off he goes, passed from one instructor to another along the upward journey. The student rises to the surface at 425 feet per minute and hardly gets his hair wet. In the event of an emergency where men will have to abandon their submarine in the depths of the ocean, each one of the submarine school graduates is now better equipped for survival because of his training in the New London escape tank. There are four recompression chambers in the building, 
In these chambers, submarine school candidates are tested for their ability to withstand pressure changes. The candidates' reactions to confined spaces are observed. These chambers are also used for instantaneous treatment in the event of a case of the bends or an air embolism casualty when bubbles of air become trapped in the bloodstream or tissue because of rapid change from deep pressure to surface pressure. The work that goes on at the escape training tank is a responsibility shared by the U.S. Naval Submarine School and the Submarine Medical Center. The center encompasses the base hospital, the medical research laboratory, and the School of Submarine Medicine. With 41 fleet ballistic missile submarines on patrol, each with two crews, 82 doctors are required. On these subs, heavy shielding protects the crew from the high radiation of the nuclear power plant. The doctor is a trained radiation health technician, constantly checking on the safety of the operation. Thus, the crew member receives less radiation on submerged patrol than he would receive from natural sources ashore. The medical officer maintains a constant vigilance over the artificial world of the spaceship beneath the sea. The tremendous electrical output of nuclear power supplies the energy for transforming seawater into clean, pure air. Testing continues for possible alien gases. The submarine medical officer also rounds out his work aboard with occasional dentistry. He's trained for sudden emergency situations and an occasional temporary filling. The officer is a general practitioner in the truest sense. He must naturally be prepared to treat the routine medical needs of the submarine crew and yet be prepared to meet any emergency. In addition to his medical scientific responsibilities, the medical officer can also perform some of the duties of regular submarine officers. The doctor must also be trained as a deep sea diver, donning the hard hat suit for personal experience. This training aids the doctor in treating cases of the bends or air embolism. Submarine Medical Center, other trainees receive the physical and psychological testing that determines their fitness to live and work beneath the sea. Here also are the quietest rooms in the world. Huge wedges of fiberglass absorb the slightest whisper of an echo as the students are tested for their ability to listen and to concentrate. Here the researchers test new listening techniques and electronic devices. The strength and effectiveness of the submarine service is advanced by the continuing research and development conducted here. Human guinea pigs volunteer for testing in huge chambers. The problems attended to the changes in environment and pressures experienced by men in submarines are dealt with by the scientists and research technicians in the medical research laboratory. Only the cream of Navy volunteers can serve in the submarine force. The Navy tests performance, academic, physical, and psychological abilities, and eliminates all but the best. Graduating officers represent the top academic achievers from the Naval Academy and from colleges and universities across the nation. They undergo six months of training in theory, six months in study and operation of nuclear power plants, winning Atomic Energy Commission accreditation, then six more months of training at the submarine school in New London. Submarine school graduates get continuous training and on-the-job instruction. For officers, it's another year of training. For the enlisted ratings, it's six to nine months before the final examination and qualification. The insignia of the Navy submarine service is a submarine flanked on each side by a dolphin. A submariner must qualify aboard a submarine before he can wear this coveted insignia. Final qualification means that he's capable of sharing the load and handling any emergency that may arise. The education of the submariner continues aboard the submarine. All officers act as instructors. At every opportunity, the new submariner is carefully indoctrinated. 
not only with a knowledge of his own job, but with the knowledge and duties and responsibilities of his shipmates. During World War II, United States submarines destroyed a total of 1,314 Japanese ships, including one battleship, eight aircraft carriers, 15 cruisers, 42 destroyers, 23 submarines. Against this score, 52 United States submarines were lost. More decorations for valor have been awarded to the submarine service than any other Navy branch. Men and the ships who have gone before are remembered in the chapel on the Thames on the upper part of the submarine base at New London Grotten. Its stained glass windows are portraits of the submarine service. Each pew is distinguished by a brass plaque on which is engraved the name of a submarine lost during World War II. In September of 1963, the chapel added a new altar, which was presented as a memorial to the 129 men lost aboard the USS Thresher in April of 1963. nuclear submarine with its missile system components is almost unbelievably complex. Its sophisticated equipment is the end result of efforts by the finest brains in the free world. Yet the human element, man himself, is the common denominator of all its elements. There is no other force in the world like our Polaris submarine fleet. The men who sail in them know it. Our peaceful patrols beneath the seas of the world are unique. They're there to make sure no shots are fired, a powerful deterrent to anyone who would launch a nuclear attack. It is one of the most reliable weapon systems ever devised for the preservation of the peace of the world. The training for this power for peace begins here at the Navy's undersea university in New London Groton. This is its beginning. <laughs>